Good morning and thank you for joining NSBA for our leadership issue discussion on taxation. All lines have been muted because we expect quite a few people on the line. Uh, we do have the chat function open, but we request that you keep it to a minimum so it's not distracting to uh, folks watching or the or the uh, panelists. Uh, if you do have any questions, those all need to go through the Q&A platform. We will not be checking the Q&A, or we will not be checking questions under the chat platform. So um, with that, my name is Molly Day and I'm gonna turn it over to Todd McCracken. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Molly, and thank you to everyone for being with us today. I think we're gonna have a really uh, interesting and important discussion on tax policy issues. I'll just give you some background. This is a conference that the NSBA usually has every two years uh, to where we set the priorities for the organization for the coming Congress and really dive deep into the issues of the day and figure out uh, what the small business community really needs and what we can expect. Well, this year we're doing it a little bit differently. We're doing it virtually for the first time. I'm actually pretty excited that we can uh, we can get greater participation actually than we have in the past as a result. Um, so thank you for doing this. Uh, this is a first step in a, in a, in a process that will uh, that will, will culminate on uh, February 23rd in a, in a, in a conference. We're looking at all these issues together, not just tax or the other ones in particular. Uh, but I'm also really pleased that uh, ML Mackey has joined us. Uh, ML is the 2021 board chair of the National Small Business Association. She's the CEO and, and co-founder of Beacon Interactive Systems uh, in Massachusetts that uh, does a lot of innovative work, especially with the U.S. military, but not exclusively, I think. Um, uh, and ML is going to talk to us a little bit about, about why this is such an important event uh, and what you all can expect. So uh, with no further ado, let me introduce ML Mackey. Mel, thanks for being here. Thank you for that kind introduction. I'm very excited for today. I'm really interested in the conversation about this complex, involved, and very important topic for uh, small businesses. Can you all hear me? You can hear me okay, right, Todd? Yes, we can. All right, excellent. Um, it, it, it's probably funny for all of us working from home. You know, I sometimes feel like I'm just in my basement versus in this very important meeting that we're having here. Um, I did want to take a moment and talk to you just briefly about the chair of the tax committee. You're all going to meet Malcolm Crowdy shortly. I, I want to tell you what I think is really fantastic about what he does in chairing this committee and who he is as an advocate is very um, germane to what all of you in the Leadership Council do and bring to NSBA. So one of the things that, or three, maybe I should say three of the things that I find really interesting about Malcolm is that he's an intersection of, his advocacy is an intersection of brains, purposefulness, and compassion. So brains, I mean really, he's one of the smartest people I know and it is so important when you're looking at an issue as important as tax that we not only think about what just happens to us, but we are purposeful about how it affects other small businesses, which is, leads me to that compassion. One of the things I appreciate about Malcolm from the very beginning of meeting him is that he didn't just advocate for what was in his swim lane or in his industry, but has a thoughtful perspective to how does this affect small business at large. This is why we've picked all of you to be on the Leadership Council. NSBA has a proud heritage, a nonpartisan and issue-based advocacy that says, make sure that we are thoughtful about the laws that we put in place, how they affect small business interests, mine, my own and others like mine. One of the things I appreciated about NSBA and some of the first few Hill visits that I went on with the organization was that because of the fantastic work that Todd and his team do putting together the content, to support the issues that we as small business have decided are important for us to focus on and advocate for is that I had knowledge of other small businesses experience. So one of the things I will encourage you to do today is to enjoy, listen to, and be informed by your colleagues on the call. And with that, I will turn it over. Thank, thank you, you Mel. Uh, and thank you for the generous introduction. Uh, good morning or afternoon, depending on what coast you're on. Uh, I'm really excited to be kicking off our Small Business Congress with discussions around taxation today. Uh, you know, prior to the pandemic, uh, our policy group was working on many issues. Um, one of the most important of which was tax reform uh, with a real emphasis on simplifying the tax code and bringing rate parity to pass through entities to really level the playing field between small businesses and large businesses. Um, also, uh, before the pandemic, uh, interstate sales tax uh, kind of popped its head up uh, as a hot topic since the 2018 Supreme Court decision in South Dakota versus Wayfair, which 
uh, ended up allowing individual states to require online sellers to collect uh, state sales tax on their sales, which, as you can imagine, is a, a, a huge uh, small bis business issue that uh, uh, we're tracking and, and, and fighting for. As you can imagine, uh, last year was an interesting year. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic shifted much of our attention to COVID relief legislation uh, to help small businesses get through these rough times. Uh, NSBA worked really closely with lawmakers to help craft uh, relief legislation such as the CARES Act, which uh, helped to create the Paytech Protection Program. And even after the PPP was passed, we continued to work with legislators to increase the simplified forgiveness application threshold to $150,000 and allow deductibility of forgiven expenses under the PPP program, uh, both of which were passed in the most recent uh, COVID relief bill uh, in December of last year. Uh, so we've really been working hard behind the scenes uh, for uh, our small business community. Um, and although the pandemic is far from over, with a new administration means new taxation policy initiatives that we are tracking to make sure we are providing a small business voice to any new legislation that's been introduced. Uh, in particular, we are tracking tax reform initiatives that could potentially include changes to capital gains, uh, business income from past two entities, corporate tax, uh, and payroll taxes, among others. Uh, Many of these issues can be found in the taxation booklet that was sent along with the uh, meeting invitation for this call. I'd highly encourage everyone to read through these issue briefs to learn more about the policy areas the NSBA Taxation Policy Group is actively working on. Uh, and with that, I'd like to turn the discussion back over to Todd, who will introduce our speakers, Mr. Brian Reardon and Mr. Garrett Watson. Uh, thank you all very much for your participation on this call, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Malcolm. And, and we're really lucky today to have a couple of, of really highly qualified guests to talk about these about these issues. And uh, Malcolm and I are going to going to talk with uh, Brian and Garrett here in just a minute. I think it would be kind of important though to sort of do a level set for everybody and where sort of where we for small business is at the moment. We've we've just completed a survey of of members and non-members, and I'd like to kind of share just sort of some of the results. Uh, of that, just so people have a sense of where things are in the country right now, just for for a minute. So, um, Molly, if you wouldn't mind sharing the the, the those slides, that would that would be great. Um, I, that should be on everyone's screen now. The 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 results. And if you go to the to the first uh, page, who are these people who are who are taking this taking this. Uh, survey that we find that, that most of them are relatively small companies. The vast majority of both our members and the small business community at large are, are, are under 20 employees. Um, and of course, the, the vast majority of them are pass-throughs of one, one type or another, the most, most common being S corporations, um, uh, followed very closely by LLCs and then sole proprietors and partnerships, but it's still not an consequential number of C corporations that are that are that are part of the part of the group. So that that it tells us, I think, a real something about um, uh, 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 who the folks are and who are designing tax policy around. Um, so if you go to the next uh, slide, we we see well, what are the challenges these folks are facing. Um, and, and directly, federal taxes are relatively low on the list because they're most concerned right now about economic uncertainty, um, largely driven by the COVID-19 pandemic, which is number two on the list, uh, which you know in turn is driving declining customer spending. So all these things we see uh, are are uh, are in turn, but federal taxes still remains a, a significant concern. And of course, there's a lot that we can do in tax policy that can change. Uh, our feelings about economic uncertainty and and, uh, and declines in consumer spending and all the rest. So there's a lot of things we can do or potentially could do uh, that could um, that could improve the other the other uh, the other numbers as well. So going forward again in the uh, in the in the survey, if we look at what folks are telling us about their priorities, though, we see that you know tax reform uh, is pretty high on the list. Two of the top five. Uh, uh, priorities that folks have are um, simplifying the tax system, which gets at the administrative burden, really, of the tax system on, on folks, which, interestingly, usually outranks the actual dollars that people pay in terms of their priorities. So, uh, so simplifying the tax system and, of course, reducing the tax burden. So two of the five top priorities for, for, for uh, both members and non-members are, 
are, are tax related. Um, and uh, just going to look a little bit more about where they see the future going right now on the next slide. Uh, you see that, you know, folks are not uh, maybe as pessimistic as they used to be, but there's still um, uh, a significant number of especially non-members don't really see significant growth opportunities in the in the next in the coming year. Um, so uh, clearly, uh, we need to keep this in mind both in terms of tax policy and other policies that there really is a moment in time when we need to look at growth-oriented uh, economic policy for sure. Um, so that's pretty much that sort of uh, a set on where I just want to give a quick overview of where folks seem to be on some of these issues before we get into the sort of more detailed tax discussion. Um, but with that, let me go ahead and introduce uh, our guest today. Uh, we're really happy to have an old friend, Brian Reardon, uh, with us today. Brian uh, currently is uh, has his own business, Reardon Consulting LC, uh, also uh, runs S Corporation Association, but has had a, a long history in advocating for the small business community and uh, and, and being well in tune with uh, small business issues, but also serving inside government. He was, uh, he was, uh, uh, special assistant to the president on the National Economic Council, um, 2003 to 2005, um, and uh, uh, really knows these issues inside and out. And then we're also joined uh, by Garrett Watson, uh, who was a senior policy analyst at the Tax Foundation and does a, a, a great deal of writing and thinking about these issues. Um, and I think his, uh, his, his papers and his presentations that I have seen uh, are, are really spot on. And I think we'll have a lot to to learn from Garrett as well. So with that, let's get started, gentlemen. Um, thanks for being with us. And uh, uh, maybe I'll ask the first question, and that is, uh, uh, what in the world is going to happen on tax policy this year? I mean, a lot of people are afraid we're going to see big Biden tax increases. Uh, but Janet Yellen says, no, no, don't worry about that right now. Brian, what do you think? Um, I, I, I'm afraid that we're going to see big tax increases this year. Um, and, and I went into the year uh, telling people that if you, you know, when a president gets elected, they have this very strange habit of actually uh, trying to do the things that they promised that they were going to do in, in, in the election. <laughs> they, they, they feel like, you know, very seriously, they, these are the things I ran on. They won, I won. You know, these are good policies. I want to get them done. Um, and so I think folks should take a look at the Biden tax plan. Um, I think it didn't get the attention it deserved for a variety of reasons. One, because you had all those wealth taxes and other things that were really extreme being thrown around at the same time. Um, also, there just wasn't that much focus on policy. But it is an extremely large tax package. It's very aggressive. Um, it would undo the corporate tax cuts that were made in 2017 and then some. So it's not just restoring the corporate tax to where it was under tax or before tax reform. It actually goes and increases taxes on C corporations by a lot. Um, a similar effect would take place with, with passers as corporations and partnerships. Um, as state taxes would go up, cap gains taxes would go up. Um, they would, they want to apply social security taxes to wages over $400,000. It's a very aggressive plan. With the narrow majorities that they have in the House and the Senate, I don't think they're gonna be able to get all of that enacted. My expectation is if you take what Biden's put forward and maybe divide it in half, that's probably what's possible legislatively for them. And then the other question, the final question is, when are they gonna do this? And early on, I thought it was gonna be early, this spring, this summer, that sort of thing. Increasingly, I'm hearing uh, from Democrats and Republicans alike that it's big tax hikes like that are unlikely. Early this year, maybe later this year, maybe next year. There does seem to be a recognition that the economy is extremely fragile right now and raising taxes on employers across the board would be a really bad idea. So tax hikes are on the horizon, but my guess is that it's a little further off than maybe I, certainly than I initially thought. Yeah. Darren, does that sound right to you? Yes, that, that does sound generally right uh, to me as well. Uh, generally what we're seeing right now is a focus by Congress and the president on the very large uh, stimulus package that we're seeing uh, that includes some tax elements, but the tax hike side of things are more, more likely to happen closer to the end of the year or early next, probably paired with large spending proposals related to infrastructure, climate mitigation, R&D, healthcare. Uh, one thing that we saw in the Biden campaign was a close pairing of various tax increases with spending proposals as a pay for. 
And so they may use the hook of trying to partially pay for very large increases in spending uh, in order to uh, sort of sidestep potential criticism about potential tax hikes. Um, and some of this may be also be to monitor the economic situation, uh, because e even with the Biden administration, they are sensitive to the idea that we don't want to be undercutting an economic recovery and introducing not just reversals of the, of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, as, as Brian mentioned, but uh, adding new taxes on top of that, some of which have never, uh, haven't been tried in a very long time. For example, applying ordinary income tax rates to capital gains that may have a, a pretty large impact in the business community and, and investment. Uh, and that's something they're going to have to take their time to design if, if uh, they want it to be implemented effectively. And, and that um, gives them some more breathing room if they do it closer to the end of the year. Yeah. We'll talk a little bit more about this capital gains business then. The Because uh, it's not just the capital gains tax and how it affects small companies and going back to individual rates. But there's also, a repro I understand it, a proposal in the, in the uh, Biden tax plan that would uh, change the step up in basis for when a, a, a business is passed on. So there would essentially be capital gains at death. Is that right? And what, what are the implications of that for a family business? That's right. Uh, the, the Biden campaign proposed several changes that interact at once. One is taxing capital gains income at ordinary rates as opposed to the preferential rates now. Uh, removing step up in basis at death. So if you do have a business that otherwise would have that basis adjustment that you're, you're passing down to a family member uh, who's going to inherit it, you may end up being hit with a tax then. Uh, and then uh, uh, an increase in the estate tax rate and a reduction in the in the uh, exemption threshold there from a little over 11 million right now back to where it was in 2009. Uh, and there's not much detail about uh, preventing potential double taxation here, where you would have a tax on that capital gain due to that elimination of step up, and then you're also potentially subject to estate tax uh, liability, and that's going to cause a lot of complications for folks who. Um, maybe have not uh, had the liquidity necessary mm -hmm. to evaluate their business and go through all that uh, process. Uh, and we haven't seen a lot of detail on how that will actually work precisely because it's so complicated. Uh, and so that is something to watch out for as they think of alternatives to some of the other more radical suggestions like a wealth tax, uh, yeah. which not only are the president interested in, but uh, several members of the Senate Finance Committee, including Senator Wyden, are exploring. Yeah, that is actually a concern of mine too. Is that we have a situation now where a lot of companies, given the high, relatively high exemption levels that we have now for estate tax, uh, have not needed to engage in the aggressive estate planning uh, that and that have been, was necessary in the past and will be necessary again. A lot of them might be caught a little flat-footed because estate planning is something that takes some time uh, to make work correctly, and a, a big increase all at once could have a, a significant impact on those companies. There, there, there is a lot of gifting going on right now. Yes. Um, can, can I build on, on what Garrett said with the, with the cap gains? Because I, I think it's particularly, you know, from a tax policy perspective, it's, it's an interesting dilemma that the Democrats have. And that is, you know, if, if you said, okay, what, what are the possibilities of a tax hike on cap gains this year? And I think that at a minimum, they'll bump the rate up to 28%. At a maximum, they'll adopt what Senator Wyden, who's now the chair of the Finance Committee, wants to do which is this mark to market idea, where every year you would have to do a valuation of your assets and those that have appreciated, you would pay cap gains that year on the appreciated value of the asset. Really complicated, really kind of a draconian approach. The reason that they think it's necessary or something like that is necessary is because the joint committee that does the scoring on, on taxes believes that there's a revenue maximizing rate for cap gains and that it's well below the current individual rate of 37% or the 39.6 that's in the Biden plan. The joint committee thinks it's around 28%. So if they want to raise taxes up to the individual rates up in the high 30s, they're going to lose revenue off cap gains because once they get the rate up above 28%, they start losing revenue. So they need to come up with some way that they can get the rate up high, but at the same time not lose all that revenue. That's where the mark-to-market plan from Biden comes in. That's where this uh, tax and cap gains at death idea that's in the Biden plan comes from. And you can see them really struggling with this idea of, well, we don't want to just do a 28% rate because then you still have this differential where Warren Buffett ostensibly, it's not true, but ostensibly pays less than a secretary, right? They don't want to just do that. They want to do more, but they can't figure out how to get around the revenue loss implications of that. So they're kind of in a box with that. I, I expect this to be the focus of intense debate. Uh, lots, of, uh, lot, lots of back and forth between the House and the Senate on the tax writing committees. 
Um, but at the end of the day, I do fully expect that tag, cap gains rates will go up to some degree. Back up, yes, and you want to add here or ask? Um, I guess uh, from uh, from the um, the new legislation that's being introduced from the Biden administration side, uh, we're also uh, looking at uh, in in the next few years uh, some of the current legislation in the tax and in the and the, um, the uh, tax act uh, sunsetting. Um, and how uh, how we're looking at that and monitoring that and um, and kind of preparing for for what that means for small businesses as, as those dates approach. Yeah, yeah that, that's going to make uh, policy making and tax uh, very busy over the next few years because you both have the prospect of these tax hikes and then you have a bunch of expiring provisions related to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Uh, two of the major ones, and of course there, there are many others uh, that will be changing, include. Uh, research and development expenses starting at the uh, beginning of next year will be amortized over five years. Very unusual tax treatment uh, when you compare it to uh, the treatment of these expenses internationally uh, and something that uh, as we have uh, increased interest from a policy perspective and in increasing R&D in the U.S. and keeping our competitive edge uh, sort of takes us uh, a step backwards in that endeavor. Uh, we also have the broader bonus depreciation uh, provisions that start phasing out over five years uh, the year after that. Uh, and so, and I just lost my, my light here. <laughs> Apologies. Just got to move around more, I guess. That, that's right. <laughs> Make sure to do that. Uh, yeah, so you, so you have these broader uh, depreciation provisions for allowing full immediate expensing that start phasing out. And in our modeling, that's a pretty strong driver of economic growth. We like to see those made permanent, especially as small businesses that take advantage of that. And of course, 179 and other expensing provisions uh, to have some permanency there uh, to be able to have that expectation as they make investment decisions coming out of uh, this uh, pandemic as we recover uh, economically. Uh, and then, of course, this all leads to, in 2025, a pretty large cliff in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act where the remaining individual provisions, the lower tax rates, uh, the, of course, the, the Section 109A pass-through deduction start uh, just ending right there. Uh, and that's going to have a pretty significant uh, effect on tax burdens on small businesses. Uh, and the big thing now is I, I think there is an expectation that tax policymakers will do something to ameliorate that, but what they exactly come to, what that compromise looks like, lot of uncertainty right now, right? And as the closer we get to that, with Congress having a, um, a tendency to wait until the very last minute to make decisions in tax policy, it's harder for, for small businesses uh, to decide how they're going to think about investments post-2025. And so uh, we've been beating the drum on making permanent tax policy, so expectations can be set. Uh, and, and that's something that folks will have to think about as they plan uh, their next steps over the next few years. Sure, that makes a lot of sense. Brian, do you have anything to add on to that? Sure, I, I would just, a couple of things. One, um, obviously 199 Cap A is something that we're intensely focused on. Uh, Jason Smith, Steve Daines in the Senate are gonna reintroduce the permanent bill there. And I know you guys are supportive of that. Um, I do expect that, you know, corporate rates are gonna be debated and perhaps changed this year. So our focus there will be on making sure that whatever the corporate rates do, that the pass-throughs have something close to parity in terms of the top rates that they're paying. Um, the other one is the 163J. This is the cap on your ability to deduct interest. Um, there is a threshold, so it doesn't apply to smaller firms. But to the extent that you have larger members, I, I'm, a lot of my members are very concerned about this. That is that right now the cap is on a broad base, so it doesn't affect them. But starting next year, it's going to be on a much narrower base. It will hit them, and it hits them really hard. Because, you know, as you know, if you're not allowed to deduct that interest expense, suddenly that balloons your taxable quote unquote income and suddenly you're paying taxes on a very large share of income that you didn't actually realize you had to pay the you know you had to pay the interest the money's gone but you're still paying taxes on it um, it's it's going to hit a lot of businesses and there's going to be a big effort to roll that back starting you know before the end of the year here yeah. well i have a question a little bit different topic it was one that malcolm brought up a little before but to the extent there is a major tax bill in the next 18 months. Uh, do you expect that uh, interstate sales tax will get dealt with as part of that? 
at the federal level? Garrett, any ideas? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the, that's a good question. I mean, we, we have seen, of course, uh, with, yeah, since the Wayfair decision, states making a, uh, their own decision subject to the limitations set out in that, in that decision. Uh, some states, of course, are much more advanced in that endeavor than others in terms of establishing uh, you know, basic rules related to you know, de minimis thresholds and, uh, and creating tax software and, and other items to, to help small businesses comply with those rules. Um, we, what we saw before Wayfair, of course, with, with interstate sales tax was, um, uh, you know, several proposals languishing federally. And that was always an option was, was having, the, having a federal, uh, federal clarity as it relates to that. And that was for many uh, taxpayer groups the, the preferred thing versus going through a, a judicial decision. Uh, but at this point, with the proliferation both of, of Wayfair-related adjustments and marketplace facilitator laws uh, on, the, on the digital side especially, there may be even less pressure uh, to deal with that uh, unless there are sort of knock-on effects. Uh, and one interesting knock-on effect is that actually some revenue for many states and localities is better than what's projected in the, uh, early in the pandemic. And part of that is because uh, remote sort of interstate sales tax collections were a bit higher uh, due to shifting consumption patterns and that new source of revenue. Um, but I'm sure it'll, it'll still be subject to federal debate as you think about uh, unintended consequences of that decision, and especially states that are lagging behind, right, and not complying with um, the various uh, items that were set aside, set aside in the Wayfair decision. Yeah, to, just to add, I think it'd be really hard for Congress to come to any kind of an agreement on what the what the policy should be, and they're going to be they're going to be dealing with enough there that uh, that this may be an issue that just gets pushed aside for a few years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, unfortunately so. Yeah. Of course, it already has been. Uh, yeah, we need to get to some, some Q and A from from uh, participants here also. But I'd like to get some sort of feedback from them, just sort of general stuff first. So I'd like to do a little quick poll that we have set up. Um, so Molly, you wouldn't mind putting that up. We, I want to ask about uh, uh, complexity and financial costs and so forth of, of the tax system. Sort of what what is the biggest problem? Because uh, we hear lots of of different. Uh, issues that small companies have one is complexity just being able to understand what in the world the rules are you know the total cost of the of the of the tax burden um sort of the administrative cost just sort of keeping up with everything having to hire uh, uh tax attorneys cpas my software and all that and then of course just the changing rules and having and how that affects your company in terms of having to change your posture and do different things based on different assumptions so if uh if people are on the line can sort of uh, panelists can't vote, fortunately, but uh, if everyone can sort of look at those and 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 uh, tell us which of those do you think is the biggest burden right now, um, to give us some direction of what you think. Uh, what direction we should go? That would be uh, really helpful. Give the voting is slowed down a bit, so we'll give it about five more seconds, and then I'll close All right. it. All right. So the complexity is the problem. And um, <clears throat> at least from the folks who are on the line right now, the single biggest issue they have with the tax system. And of course, uh, the, while, we, while the uh, Tax Cut and Jobs Act from a few years ago reduced the tax burden for, for at least to some degree for almost every small business, it also added some complexity in terms of the way they have to calculate their, their, their income. Um, maybe Brian, I'll ask you this question. Do you, do you see that getting simplified in some way uh, in the future? Are there better ideas that you see as, as the, as the, to, to achieve that parity for, uh, for, for pass-throughs? Sure. There are better ideas. Um, I mean, we've always supported the idea of just having a single top rate for everything and then a single layer of tax. So if I go incorporating the corporate tax code into the individual so that you know, it doesn't matter whether it's corporate income or individual income or investment income, whatever, it pays the same top rate. And if you do that, you can eliminate, you know, whole sections of the code that are devoted to cracking down on gaming and arbitrage and all the rest of it. Um, I don't think that's on the table anytime soon here. Um, you know, when they did the 2017 tax reform, simplicity was supposed to be a big part of it, but it kind of fell by the wayside in trying to make, you know, everything fit within the budget parameters that they had set. Um, certainly for lower income folks, if you get the standard deduction, the tax code's pretty simple. If you don't get the standard deduction, if you run a business, it's not simple. And frankly, it's not 
good news, but I, I don't see it getting any simpler anytime soon. Yeah, we're we're far from the uh, the promise postcard uh, application, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah, it, we definitely echo that. And of course, we 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 had I guess something like a postcard I think for one year before they finally the IRS reverted it because there were so many other schedules they had to put on other <laughs> to make it a postcard. Uh, the but, stack of postcards got too thick. Uh, the, let's do maybe fifty-two postcards would be the right idea. Right? <laughs> I didn't see how many postcards. So. Uh, yeah, but we definitely agree with Brian that the, the, the ultimate solution, right, the ideal solution is to have uh, an, an integrated code that treats all business and investment income alike. And you don't have to de develop uh, what is a, Ro a Rube Goldberg machine uh, to, to counter or navigate differences and disparities in effective rates and prevent gaming and, and converting one type of income into another, right? Uh, yeah, and, and the fundamental challenge is that's not um, really on the table right now. And so then the question is, given what we have and the limitations, uh, both politically uh, in terms of a policy design, what are the right the right trade offs? Uh, one knock on effect, I think, of a corporate rate increase potentially is there's going to be a call for uh, just separately uh, an increase in small business and pass through rates just to maintain parity. Because the worry is if there is a disparity, it's, it's effectively what we saw with the TCJA, but in reverse, right? And so th that's going to be something both to educate folks about what are really the effective rates on small businesses, uh, which are often much higher than folks tend to realize, uh, and what is the real path forward to ensure that we can have uh, an, a, an equitable um, uh, playing field as it relates to tax, um, especially be because of the, um, on the compliance side, uh, the fact that um, you know, larger firms, often C corporations, can uh, bear higher burdens in the tax system than smaller firms. Uh, and so um, we have that in different areas. We have patchy treatment here and there in terms of uh, ensuring that there's simplicity, uh, but a more integrated effort would be <laughs> would be better uh, moving forward uh, so that folks don't have to deal with the, the complexity issue. Yeah, I think that's a real threat. Todd and I were just talking about the other day uh, how, how difficult it is to get the small business pass through tax rate lower to, to get parity with, with larger corporations. But how easy it is to slip up when, when they want to make parity when the, when the tax rates are increasing. So real, real struggle for, for our community, for sure. I also want to remind people one more time, I want to get to some Q&A here in just, just a minute, but if you want to ha ask a question, make sure you use the Q&A tab, not the chat uh, button to do that, because that's the one we're going to be paying the most attention to. Uh, so uh, I'm going to ask Molly to sort of go through those questions and begin to, to, to pose some of them. So Molly, get, get, uh, um, get some of those ready, and uh, uh, we'll go to those in just a second. I just had one quick question about, you know, we keep talking about tax bills uh, and how to change the system, and a lot of that's driven by uh, ways to get to what at least some people think is that they're, they're, they're more ideal tax system overall. But what about just good old fashioned tax increases to pay for things? I mean, uh, if there is a, uh, uh, an increase, for instance, in uh, healthcare benefits that, that comes about, you know, a, a bill like that might just have a component that says, we're gonna pay for this in this way. What do you think, what are the things that you think the small business community should be looking at and, and, and uh, if something like that were to happen, what are the, what are the likeliest uh, pain points? Well, I, I think the first threshold we're gonna face is, is with the highway bill. Um, they wanna do a big infrastructure bill. They're gonna use, my understanding is they're gonna use this second reconciliation process that they have access to, which means that they can move it through the Senate with a simple majority vote rather than the 60 votes you normally need. Um, and the, that highway bill will be accompanied by tax policies. Increasing the corporate rate is a likely contender. Some sort of a gas tax, BTU tax, carbon tax is, is also a possibility. But I think that's going to be the first sort of vehicle where we're really looking at, oh, they're going to raise taxes. And, you know, as, as Garrett or, or Malcolm mentioned, you know, if, if they raise the corporate rate, they're going to be looking at raising rates on passers too, either by reducing or eliminating the 199 cap A deduction, raising the individual rate itself, combination of the two. So that's, that's where we're starting to, you know, right now it seems like we dodged a bullet on this COVID bill that it's under consideration right now. There aren't really any big tax hikes in there. The next one's going to be this highway bill, and I fully expect to have a big battle then. 
Yeah, but I agree with, with Brian that the most likely immediate uh, non-COVID related spending will, will likely be on infrastructure uh, and it will include tax increases on, on both C corporations and pastor uh, firms in one way or another. Uh, on, on healthcare, it, it was interesting in, in the primaries, of course, there was the largest agreement both on the design of what that might look like, but also the financing where someone like Senator Warren tried to come up with a way, the, the big challenge really being, even if you don't want to increase uh, sort of net costs of healthcare on either businesses or individuals, uh, you have to develop a pretty um, robust and complicated system of transferring the existing payments to health insurers uh, to the government, right? And that can include uh, something like what Warren proposed in the, in the primaries, uh, which includes some sort of equivalent surcharge of whatever premiums are being paid now. So instead you're paying those to the government. Uh, and of course, uh, President Biden came out with a more um, effectively a more moderate plan but coming out with a public option and so that may not require quite the uh, level of disruption there uh, but we still expect that from a tax and a fiscal perspective th those will be perspectives that will be considered uh, with Senator Ward of course being on the on the Senate Finance Committee uh, and as I think about options in Congress which may or may not follow exactly what the president campaigned on uh, and so of course you'll have, we'll have a lot of lead time on what that might look like uh, but I expect that conversation will continue as we move as uh, many folks want us to move closer to you know, a European style healthcare system, uh, the transition cost, even if you think that that system is, is now net better, is gonna be uh, both significant and the design details matter a lot uh, for small businesses and others who are currently bearing healthcare costs privately. Now, can anything else you wanna add before we get to some Q&A? Yeah, I wanted to touch on one thing uh, Garrett uh, mentioned earlier in our conversation on, on incentives. It seems like there is, at least some alignment on the uh, the Trump tax plan, the Trump administration tax plan, and the Biden administration tax plan on investment into uh, opportunity zones, uh, as well as incentives for manufacturing businesses uh, and, and other businesses uh, to to come back on on the U.S. shores and, and whatnot. And just one one if uh, you guys could comment on uh, some of the incentive aspects of the of the tax plans. Yeah, I, uh, it's definitely part of a broader trend that we're seeing federally where there's a lot of interest in onshoring supply chains, uh, particularly more, uh, more recently, it's been narrowly focused on pharmaceuticals and PPE. We have a few bills in Congress uh, by Republicans and Democrats to do some of this. Uh, and, and we're also seeing uh, some bigger picture onshoring proposals by the president, both a, uh, a carrot in the form of a tax credit uh, that he's proposed uh, and a stick in the form of a, a surcharge uh, on uh, certain, uh, basically, uh, income derived from certain imports from, a, from abroad that could have been made here. Uh, and so the, the, the trend that we tend to see with these types of proposals, particularly the more far-reaching ones, is not a lot of detail about something as simple as, as basic definitions of what uh, types of activity would be considered onshore, how the credit would be applied, um, and, and uh, sometimes uh, you need more of that detail given how complicated a lot of global supply chains are uh, both for C corporations and for uh, smaller businesses. Uh, and, and of course, the other point, I think, in the, in the Biden plan more narrowly is uh, certain aspects of Biden's plan would undercut the very incentives that he wants to create. Um, this is more on the C Corp side, but he wants to create a minimum tax on, on book income for corporations, which would actually claw back a lot of the credits that he wants to provide through uh, for onshoring. Uh, and so, you know, the first step is you just got to develop a coherent framework for what types of activities you want to uh, incentivize in the tax code. Um, and, and I think the big thing on, on the sort of learning from the Opportunity Zone experience is if we're, we are gonna do things like this in, in, through the tax code, uh, you, you have to make it accessible, but you also have to have the uh, measurements in place to know whether or not it's working. That's one thing, even the Advocates for Opportunity Zones at the state level wanted that in the original bill. We've gotten some of that through some decisions that Treasury has made, uh, but unfortunately we didn't get as, as robust measurement as we could have uh, and that's really important to be able to tell sort of uh, after the fact, is it actually hitting a policy goal? If we're going to you know, include complex, additional complexity in the tax code to, to derive this benefit for onshoring, is it actually working? Uh, that'll be an important thing for, for that to be built into uh, whatever provision ends up being implemented, uh, if any at all, uh, moving forward. Sure. So I, I agree with everything that Garrett said. I, I've been putting most of the you know, the export tax and in, uh, insuring all the, all the policy that the Biden folks have uh, talked about into the category of more rhetoric, less policy. I mean, there are no details out there. 
it'll be really difficult to construct something that not only doesn't violate our trade agreements that we have with other countries, but as Garrett says, doesn't run headlong into the other policies that they're advocating for, right? So I think that's a challenge and I'd be very surprised if there's significant policy in that direction moving this year. Um, with regard to uh, uh, enterprise zones, that sort of thing, opportunity zones, uh, sort of a similar effect where I think, you know, the, the, the Democrats running the Congress right now, they like the idea of the opportunity zones, they just don't like the fact that the tax benefits go to wealthy people. And so they're sort of conflicted on that front as well. Uh, I'm not sure how they're going to address that, but if they do do something along those lines, I think they're going to try to make sure that, you know, the benefits are available to a broad swath of investors, not just people with, you know, very wealthy people sitting on lots of capital gains. All right, well, thank you. Let's let's get some uh, questions from our participants here uh, who are on the line. Molly, will you uh, give us the first uh, question we've gotten? Sure thing. The first one is from Bob Schmidt, and he asks, how can we protect the tax preference for capital gains for private companies and small businesses to help provide growth funding for the next generation of new businesses? That's a good question. Um, I, I, think, yeah, I think a number of things. One, obviously, you know, as the policy moves forward, we're going to um, oppose any attempts to raise capital gains taxes, period. Um, there are different cutouts like uh, 1202 applies for qualified small businesses where if you invest in a C Corp and do certain things and you hold on to the stock for five years or 10 years or something like that, then you can avoid cap gains that way. Um, my guess is that there will be different provisions offered up like that. Uh, as as an institution, as a group, the S Corp Association tries to avoid those sort of narrow niche types of tax benefits. We're looking for broader, uh, more uh, comprehensive type, you know, rate, same rate for everybody, that sort of thing. Uh, you know, otherwise you just complicate the tax code and, and you're just kind of creating this dynamic where some people win, some people lose, and there's really no rationale for why either ends up in the camp that they do. So. Yeah, I, I think a, a big part of it, of course, uh, for, for, for some folks anyway, is, is education in terms of understanding why uh, those cap gains rates are different from ordinary income. A lot of folks don't understand the broader context of you know, the full tax burden on businesses uh, and on savings and investment. Uh, the Tax Foundation, we are, we've been launching a project on sort of analyzing the effects of different tax proposals on save, savers and investors, uh, something that, of course, is driving um, I think it's what the question was getting at, right? Uh, American uh, sort of dynamism, especially, and putting it in the context of what we've seen um, that's really concerning over the past you know, decade plus, which is a really a decline in you know, new business formation in American dynamism. So really tying uh, whatever drivers or contributors that tax policy has toward that problem uh, and that yeah, raising capital gains rates without uh, that, that due consideration of the broader context is going to undercut that, as well as just it, it often doesn't, actually achieve your policy goals. As, as Brian mentioned earlier, if you just raise the rates without doing going even further, you may end up losing revenue uh, because folks can adapt their behavior and not realize those gains uh, in the face of a higher rate. Uh, and so uh, that kind of education we found uh, here at Tax Foundation to be uh, effective, especially uh, with policymakers in the media who otherwise just see you know, these rates and without any context and think, oh wait, this is a really easy way to, to raise revenue. Um, so just one part of the fight, of course, uh, but that's, uh, I think, an important part of it. Yeah, if I could expand on that, because I think, you know, one of the themes that we've been hitting in recent weeks and months is this notion that under the pandemic, you know, large public companies are really benefiting from the fact that many of them are allowed to stay open. Many of them are like, you know, computer companies that are thriving under current conditions. They all have access to remarkably cheap capital because all the central banks have, you know, eliminated interest rates and, you know, we've got the Fed doing quantitative easing and other things. That's not helpful to private companies that aren't allowed to open or fully open, that are in neighborhoods or industries that are restricted in what they're being able to do. You know, it doesn't, you know, you can't help uh, those businesses with fiscal and monetary policy when you've got effectively a vertical supply curve, it just doesn't work. So you really do have this, the wealthy, the, the Wall Street Journal, you know, the Wall Street, I should say, um, you know, businesses like Apple, et cetera, doing extremely well right now, and a lot of private companies getting really hurt. And the simple fact is that Apple doesn't pay the cap gains rate. 
the capped gains rate is largely reserved for private companies and private investors. And as Garrett says, there is a huge amount of misunderstanding as to why it's lower than the other rates that people pay. Educating is a big deal, but also emphasizing the fact that we really are suffering from a disparate outcome right now. And it's a part because of the, the central banks and the policies they're doing. It's also partly because of the tax cut and the way it treats public companies who have access to untaxed pools of capital differently than all those private companies that we all represent. All right, what's the next question, Molly? Uh, you know, Todd, I think you all already kind of alluded to this, but Bradley Cross asks, what tax changes are included in the newest relief bill? Do you want to touch on that briefly? I think he's referring to the to the, to the to President Biden's COVID relief package. It, it's pretty light on the tax front in yeah. terms of things that would affect businesses. I've got the list right here. So the employee retention credit that was part of the CARES Act, they're expanding yeah. and modifying that. Um, they have this worldwide interest allocation rule issue that I was concerned some of my larger members might be affected by this, but they're not. Uh, it seems to be just a restatement of current policy. An extension of the paid sick and leave, family leave, that was the part of that bill that was just before the CARES Act. So they're extending that. Uh, relief for multi-employer pension plans, extended amortization for single employer plans, and extension of pension fund stabilizing percentages for single employer plans. I have no idea what that is. <laughs> so you know, I, I looked through the list and I didn't see a whole lot there that was of, of, of import right. to our members. I did check on the well, then, rules. Then, then of course, there's the deductibility the of the forgiven expenses under the PPP program, which was a, a big hot topic issue with the IRS um, yep. initially saying that those would be, uh, uh, you, you'd have to, uh, include those in your tax bill, but now, now, now not. So big win there. Yeah, that was in the previous bill though, right? Was that That's right. Yeah, it was right. included in the, in the late December bill. Uh, so that clarity there was good, it was good to see. Um, and the other thing just related to that, I think the relief bills more broadly is, is we've been looking into uh, take up rates and sort of the experience that smaller businesses have had in uh, accessing that relief over the past year. Uh, where we've seen, of course, uh, many businesses oh, went off again. Um, <laughs> says, see if I can try to turn on this way. If not, I'll I'll do it after. Uh, many businesses are uh, seeing uh, there it is uh, the um, got a lot of benefit, of course, from PPP loans and other non-tax uh, provisions, uh, and can sort of comparing that take up with many of the tax provisions, like the employee retention credit, like the uh, employee side. Uh, employer side payroll tax deferral over two years and trying to see are, are there lessons learned there. Of course, we saw the IRS was, was very overwhelmed with uh, a backlog and trying to process a lot of this uh, relief over the course of, uh, of 2020 and early 2021. Uh, so there's probably a lot to learn about which ones were taken up the most, seen as advantageous, uh, and uh, refining our relief response in the future so that it can be uh, more simple for smaller, smaller businesses to access uh, so that there is... Um, uh, not just both the perception that there's equal sort of relief being provided both to larger C corporations and, and small businesses, but also that it's actually in practice working as, as intended. I like the fact that we've got a light show with Garrett, not just tax policy, but also a light show going on. It's very good. That's right. <laughs> so. Okay. Great. Well, the, the next question revolves around uh, the most popular person in all of DC, Senator Joe Manchin. Uh, Gary Kushner asks, will he be the linchpin vote on any of these tax provisions in the Senate? I think he's gonna be the linchpin vote on every item that they bring to the Senate floor for the rest of our lives. <laughs> there, there, are, there are a number of, 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 of moderates, uh, uh, cinema from uh, Arizona and some of the new folks that just recently got elected. Um, who are who are likely to be swing votes on a lot of different issues, but I do think Joe Manchin is is the most likely. Um, my experience with him is he talks a good game, but doesn't always vote the same way he talks. So we'll just have to see. But some of these issues, like the filibuster and other things, I I expect him to stand strong on them. Great. Our next question is uh, for companies that are looking to sell. What would you suggest? Sell sooner or wait and see what happens. Um, we, I don't give tax advice, I do policy advice. And the policy advice I would give is if you're thinking about selling rates are not going down anytime soon. <laughs> so, sooner the better. 
Yeah, and the related thing I've, I've seen some discussion on is whether or not any tax changes that happen closer to the end of the year might may be made retroactive. Uh, and and one, one point that was informative, I think, was by Matt, Mark Mazur, who is now was at Tax Policy Center and is now in the, the Treasury Department, uh, made some comments on this, saying that, um, interestingly, did not rule it out completely, though he did say the later in the year that tax, these changes are made, the less likely the policymakers will consider making it um, retroactive to the beginning of the year. Uh, but that is something else that we're looking to um, as, as I think about um, you know, raising revenue and, and getting creative, uh, which, of course, I'm sure has yeah a lot of bearing on folks' decisions about what they want to do this year. Yeah, just to build on that, you know, I think there's there's three possibilities for an effective rate for a tax hike done this year, particularly like a cap gains type rate hike. One would be the beginning of the year. The next would be date of introduction. So the date that they introduce the bill, they'll put out some statement saying, you know, we're, we're proposing to raise the tax hike, the cap gains rate to 28 or 37, whatever it is. And we're going to make the rate hike effective for transactions that occur after today. And then the final thing would be date of enactment or next year or something like that. Um, I think the date of introduction, particularly for a behavioral issue like a cap gains rate hike, is most likely. They're not going to want to put out a, you know, a big tax hike and then give people time to sell their business or to do transactions to capture the lower rates that preceded it. Um, they could reach back to January 1, but as Garrett says, the longer this goes into the year, the less likely they are. Um, there's, there's a general, and Richard Neal has talked about this, the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, considered what, there, there's a general aversion to doing really retroactive type tax hikes. So if, if uh, I'm in a position to sell an asset, I just want to make sure I sell it before they introduce whatever this tax bill is that they're going to be debating this summer. And when do you think that'll be? I would look at May, April, May. All right. What else we got, Molly? Great. The next question is from Juan Faria. Uh, what are the effects on cryptocurrency and your thoughts on this market? Mm. Wow. Garrett, you're the, uh, you're the Bitcoin <laughs> expert? Uh, yeah, I, I wish I was, or I knew which which direction I was going. Uh, that would be helpful nowadays. Uh, yeah, from from a tax perspective, I think both not 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 just crypto, but also the the whole GameStop situation has, and to the increase in in retail uh, investing uh, as sort of a cultural issue. I think if anything, might make <laughs> capital gains uh, and, and tax treatment more uh, of interest to folks. At least uh, how it works now and why it works the way it does. Uh, of course, the um, on the Bitcoin side and with crypto, we're sort of still in that in between, right? Where the the IRS is um, sort of moving forward, trying to get away from the wild west that we were at over the past few years, and trying to provide some guidelines and rules for uh, individuals who are participating in that market. Uh, and so, and, and and much more so now. There's much wilder swings in in the in the variation of the price, and and that that's the big issue, right? Is both uh, tracking the movements of, of this of this asset, uh, depending on how you're investing in it digitally, as well as just dealing with the implied uh, gain and loss as you sell, uh, and making sure you you keep track of that, because otherwise you may end up with a much uh, radically different tax bill uh, if the if you're using a, a basis that's that's incorrect, right? And so um, I think there's there's two issues there. One is is how do you provide that education and guidance um, and a framework so that folks participating who may otherwise not be used to this uh, to participating in an asset that uh, has such a such a, such a large swing in the value of the asset, as well as uh, the IRS trying to ensure that there's uh, there's rules out there that can that can be complied with reasonably, uh, and this applies to other assets too, of course. But I, I imagine that's um, from a tax change perspective, of course, most folks who are investing in this, uh, as as long as they're under that four hundred thousand threshold, are unlikely to. Um, be directly affected, though it will be interesting to see, as we've seen in other experiences in other countries, as you change taxes on investment income, there are there often is a behavioral change in in um, in markets uh, for assets like Bitcoin. And so, uh, if it's very you know uh, heavily invested by folks above that threshold, you could see some market effects. Uh, so that's something else folks will have to keep in mind. Okay. All right, we got just a few more minutes before we move on to the next part of our agenda of Q and A. So let's try to do kind of a, I don't know lightning round of questions and responses, Molly, what, what's, what's answerable fast? Uh, Tony Airbar <laughs> asks, how do we get Congress to make an actual change rather than just kicking the can down the road again and again? Actual change on? 
I, I'm guessing anything. Yeah. Yeah. So not an easy question. Maybe I can pop over to the next one. I, well, well, I, I would just say that, you know, having worked in Congress for a long time, sometimes gridlock is your friend. And for the business community, I know my members would embrace gridlock with a big old bear hug right now if they could get it. My concern is things are going to pass and it's going to be bad for our businesses. Yeah, and, and the only thing I'd add to that is we do have some experience in making permanent good policy occasionally. Uh, the, the experience with extenders at the end of the year, the temporary policy, it's frustrating because every year they keep getting, the can keeps getting kicked, right? Uh, but we did have an experience in, in 2015 when the, the PATH Act was passed, which is very much an imperfect piece of legislation, yeah. but at least it made permanent certain important extenders. So that what we did right in that experience, uh, which was bipartisan, could be something for us to build on moving forward if we do have any hope of a more permanent tax policy. Great. Uh, another question that um, that I know NSBA used to, to work quite a bit on and that we'll be talking about in just a minute, um, the Fair Tax Act. You know, we're talking about simplification. Is there any likelihood fair tax is going to be in the conversation in the next couple months? I, I don't expect it to be. I think simplification is, is not a popular topic this these days in Congress, unfortunately. Um, and if we do do anything along the lines of a, like a consumption tax or something, it'll probably be targeted at carbon as opposed to a sales tax. Yeah, I agreed with that. And, and, and the one thing I'd add is we, we are getting a little bit of progress in terms of the importance of simplicity on the individual side. You know, the, the, uh, wh whether you like it or dislike it, uh, there seems to be a focus on, hey, like if we just do very simple transfers to low income folks, that's better than some complex policy design. Uh, and the problem is it, uh, that has not been applied on the business side of things, you know, that, that very lesson uh, about simplicity. And so that's probably the next step uh, for folks who, who like that kind of design for you know, individual payments uh, should think about that when they're thinking about how to structure business taxation. Great. Um, I do have one that's a little bit technical, but I think kind of an important question. This is from Gary. Uh, any chance the tax policy will change to allow small employers that aren't C-Corps so that owners can participate in their own health and welfare benefit plans, similar to how IRC Section 401 allows owner employees to participate in their own retirement plans? I, I'm sure there is legislation out there. I have not worked on that in, in recent years, but I think it'd be a great idea. Yeah, I'd have to check and see. I, I know that there's, you know, there, there was the the Secure Act, which passed a couple of years ago. That's that helped, you know, rationalize some of our our retirement benefits in the tax code. Uh, and there is some, there was some talk at least a few months ago about a follow-on companion bill uh, that may, may be bipartisan. Uh, but I'm not I'm not sure if that particular proposal has been included in that. But that that might be one bright spot for potential bipartisan action this year on tax. The next one is from uh, Kevin Johnson. This is kind of a broad question. He asks, a transportation infrastructure bill has been discussed as necessary or essential for years. What is the best way to pay for such a bill? Does a transportation infrastructure bill have the ability to grow GDP? Garrett, you guys got the fancy models. <laughs> yeah, yes, so, so typically, I mean, we, historically we found that, you know, the return on investment for infrastructure uh, can be positive, though it's often lower than the most optimistic uh, uh, advocates of such spending project, especially if you're not including the various cost overruns and, and issues, sort of the non-tax issues that we have with that type of investment. Uh, the one thing that we, we are working on the infrastructure side is, of course, uh, reforming and, and rationalizing our our gas tax, which uh, is um, it can be a polarizing issue for some folks. But you know, ideally, uh, from a tax policy perspective, you'd want to tie uh, who, whoever's paying for the infrastructure to the benefit that's being received there. Uh, and the gas tax is one imperfect way of doing that. The problem is, of course, it's the value of it is often eroding over time. And you have many folks who are operating electric vehicles and, and other forms of transportation that don't um, attach the use of infrastructure with the revenue. And so uh, that's something that's been brought up um, uh, even most recently by, by Pete Buttigieg, uh, the, the, treasurer, uh, the transportation secretary. Uh, and the, the challenge there is it is polarizing because you do have other issues that are hard to, to balance. For example, how do you deal with farmers who might be dealing with a, that tax increase, uh, but not using infrastructure. Uh, but that'll be, I think, an important part of the conversation, especially in the context of the, of the highway trust fund in the next few years. Okay, time for one more or should we? One more, let's do one more. Okay. 
Great. Um, this is this question asks uh, an example of complexity. Uh, many federal tax breaks, for example, some PPP forgiven loans are not federally taxable for the last federal legislation, still have to be passed by each state. Is there a way to design federal tax laws to apply to states also? Hmm. I think the short answer is no. Uh, I just testified up in Minnesota a couple of weeks ago. They're looking at conforming the PPP treatment there at the state level with the federal level so that their businesses don't get double taxed. Um, I think, you know, just the way that our federal system is set up, either states have automatic conforming rules that allow them to automatically conform to what changes are made at the federal level or they don't. And it, that's something that the states themselves will have to decide on. But I, yeah. I, we totally support making sure that everybody gets PPP loan forgiveness tax free at both the state and the federal level. Yeah, that's right. Well, Wisconsin is also making, uh, has made progress on this and, uh, and that, 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 that's right. It's mostly tied to the fact that uh, state tax codes start in different places and may not conform to the recent, um, the recent uh, internal revenue code. And so just pushing policymakers that, that that's a good broad thing to do. We saw this with TCJA when they had to try to conform or, or disconnect from various TCJA related changes in the state tax codes. Uh, and this is another example of that. Mm -hmm. All right, gentlemen, we will let you go. We really appreciate your time and expertise today. Uh, it's been extremely helpful as we try to uh, navigate these issues and figure out what uh, where to place our time and priority. So uh, thanks again. We'll stay in touch and uh, um, uh, good luck out there. Thank you. Really appreciate it. It was Thank fun. You. Yeah, That's great. Good. Thank you. Uh, well, for the rest of us, we got some more work to do because uh, we want to kind of digest some of this uh, and uh, do a little bit of, uh, of, of prioritization from this group. Because what we want to do is is take the input after you've listened and had a chance to kind of digest some of that. We know we didn't get everybody's questions, uh, but uh, to then take that and figure out what we want how, what we want to convey to the larger ultimate small business Congress meeting that's happening in two weeks. Cause uh, that's, that's the session where, where we'll provide from this session tax input from the you know, regulatory session next week, they'll provide regulatory burden input. And for that session will decide at the end, okay, of all these various issues, where should an SBA ideally put its priority in time? Uh, I do want to emphasize, uh, as part of this prioritization, these priorities for the association really are our guide star, but they're not um, dispositive in the sense that we have to remain nimble and flexible. Uh, for instance, this past year in 2020, you know, having a paycheck protection program to fund small businesses during a pandemic wasn't anywhere on our priority list because no one saw it coming. Nevertheless, we obviously were really engaged and active in, in both making that happen and then on, on trying to help people navigate it after the fact. We will continue to do that. We're not going to ignore opportunities that arise or, or problems that crop up uh, just because back in February, we voted on a priority list that didn't have those things maybe on it or as high as they should be because uh, life and history happen, right? But anyway, we need to have a, a sense of where we're going and what really is uh, uh, important uh, to our leaders and the people who are really in tune with the small business community, who are small business people, and who are helping leading us forward. So that's what this whole process really is about. Uh, so we, we want to get your input on those things. But I'm going to pause and see, uh, first off, before we get to that, ask Malcolm, um, uh, if uh, he has any particular reactions for what we just heard or any kind of uh, wisdom he'd like to impart to people as, as we move to, to, to assessing and getting your sense of priority. No, sure. No, it's a, a, a really great discussion. Uh, I appreciate all the uh, questions from the, uh, from the audience. Um, again, sorry, we were able to get to all those, but uh, I think uh, we were seeing uh, trends and really just tracking a lot of the uh, priority issues that the Biden administration has put out there um, and uh, getting a sense for uh, when those uh, might try to, to take effect. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're still really actively looking at COVID relief uh, legislation and how we can uh, mold that to, to best affect small business. I don't think that's going away uh, anytime soon, obviously. Right. Uh, there's still there's still talks on on new legislation uh, to be passed uh, in in the very near term. 
so, you know, we're, we're looking at that. Uh, we're also looking at what the post uh, COVID uh, economic recovery looks like and, and how uh, we can affect policy uh, direction uh, in that regards and, and, and bolster the small business community as we start uh, exiting the COVID pandemic and looking at uh, growth again. So mm -hmm. I, think, uh, I think this is gonna be a, a really uh, intense uh, year for us. Um, lots of different avenues coming together, uh, lots of directions to look at, and uh, probably lots of changes uh, that are gonna come our way uh, both expected and, and unexpected. So uh, we're going we're gonna to keep uh, uh, tracking all of these things from the uh, taxation uh, policy perspective and, uh, and using the input that we get from the Small Business Congress to help, help guide our direction. Uh, but like Todd said, uh, we need to be flexible and nimble as well and make sure that uh, we're, we're doing what's in the best interest of our, of our community. So thank you again, and uh, yeah. I'll leave it back to Todd. Yeah, and then also add that uh, as the year goes on, uh, Malcolm will also be chairing our our taxation uh, uh, issue committee, which is open to everybody who's on the uh, leadership council. Uh, if you'd like to sign up, and we'll be having us uh, uh, events and briefings over the course of the year, much like right. what you just heard, I think, uh, as mm -hmm. things develop to to become more educated and to and provide your input on what's going on. So make sure you're involved in those things. So first off, I think we'll let's let's have some uh, 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 sense of on tax reform what the priorities from people would be. Not in terms of specific provisions. That's that's we want to get a more sense of what kinds of tax reform as these bills move forward should we be giving our attention to. So, um, uh, Molly, if you wouldn't mind putting the question of uh, uh, the tax reform priorities uh, up for folks to vote on. Um, so how important is it to sort of get as close as possible to parity between large and small business? Bearing in mind that as we just heard that there is a double-edged sword there that um, as uh, if there are increases now in corporate rates uh, back to where maybe where they closer to where they were before the Tax Cut and Jobs Act of a couple of years ago, that push for parity could be counterproductive for pastors at this point in a way that uh, it left us behind before. Uh, and then simplification, uh, having a sense of, of uh, being able to really understand the tax law and to implement it effectively. Um, uh, the other is there were some significant tax cuts for small companies and pass-throughs as part of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, that's the TCGA that you see there, um, but they're temporary. Uh, and they're going to expire uh, over the next few years. So how important is, is achieving some level of permanency in those to you? And then finally, which is related, but not the same as TCGA, but just sort of predictability in the tax law. I mean, we just heard a lot of discussion about, about potential changes, about retroactive changes that could have a significant impact in ways that people couldn't uh, predict uh, when they make business decisions. So how important are those things? So. Um, uh, please take a minute and rank those uh, or, or, or choose those and l let us know sort of a sense of priority for you on just that particular question. We're still getting some folks answering, so let's leave it open for another 10 seconds and then we'll close it. Okay, here we go. Okay, so simplification is, is relatively high, the highest I should say, but uh, permanency of TCJA and other provisions is, uh, is uh, fairly close behind. So that's very helpful um, as we consider. And then parity and predictability are a bit, are a bit lower down uh, on the list, so. Thank you all for that. I do have a question that we're sort of uh, potentially calling an audible. I'm not sure if this is possible, but we did have a comment about whether to add um, preservation of capital gains rates for small businesses as one of the choices on the next poll we're going to do. And I'm going to just sort of ask Molly if that would be something we could do on the fly or if it's something we should uh, uh, go without and just realize that it's obviously a concern. I think we can add it if you could give me just a few minutes. Okay. 
That's good. I think that would be a good idea. Um, I want to add also, I don't know if folks on the line have had an opportunity to register for other similar events. We're going to be doing a whole series of these, as you've seen. This is the very first one we're doing, and then tomorrow we're doing uh, uh, labor and workforce issues, and then on Thursday we're doing healthcare policy, and then a whole another round next week, but and then the culminating event is on uh, uh, February 23rd, and so you're welcome to register for any or all of those that you're interested in. So I'd encourage you to do that, um, and uh, the. The, the final session on the 23rd, we think, is going to be a fairly large event because it will be open, unlike these first six, which we're really focusing on input from small business leaders and the Leadership Council, that final session on the 23rd will be open to, to, um, uh, to all members uh, of the association. And uh, so we expect a much larger, a larger contingent, but we'll get, be able to get much more input that way as well. So. With that, anything else to add, Malcolm? Uh, no, I think uh, I think this has been a really good event. I'd, I'd, again, I'd encourage everybody to uh, participate in the uh, next several calls. Um, all, all these all these issues tend to, to link together in in one, one way or another. Um, so uh, yeah. it's it's interesting to see the different perspectives and and get yeah. a feel for how they all interact and, and play together. Well, we're gonna have to ask the next set of questions for which things are the highest priority. And I'd like to kind of describe these a little bit. I think we've, we've added the capital gains permanency onto the list. One of them is though, it falls into this area, which is one we haven't discussed explicitly. And that is the, the deficit. Um, and how do we bring down the deficit and the role of entitlement reform? Uh, because of course, um, while a lot of us see the need during these difficult economic times to provide uh, economic stimulus and to, uh, even if that means increasing the debt, the national debt, it's also the case that we've been increasing to the national debt even in good times. And so we're having to do this at, at a moment nationally where the debt's already at, 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 at just levels I think most of us never thought we would see. And now we're adding to it, maybe the right decision right now, because but but we're having to realize it's because we made bad decisions in the past that this could have negative consequences sooner than we realize. And of course, most people think some sort of a, a credit crunch, credit, credit contraction is coming that could come all at once or it could be a gradual uh, eating away of our, of our, of our uh, asset base in the country through higher interest rates. Uh, I mean, right now, the federal government can borrow money that's very nearly free and uh, when things change and interest rates go up, the share of our national expenditures that will just be going to pay people who are lending us money, be they foreign or domestic, is will become a huge share of our national federal spending. Um, and that's ought to concern everyone. So that's one of those issues that we didn't get into today, but but will be on the list of asked to prioritize. Um, uh, along, of course, with interstate sales tax, um, and also another issue that came up tangentially, but we didn't get into in detail in the, in the Q&A or, or the roundtable discussion, which is uh, the self-employment tax on health insurance. I mean, right now, uh, self-employed people can't deduct their own health insurance expenses uh, the way they can their employees, the way other, other businesses can for everyone who works in the company. Uh, that's a fundamental unfairness uh, and one that's gone too many years without being addressed. So that's on the list. Um, and then, of course, the tax reform, the elements of which we just had a, a bit of a prioritization of. So, Molly, if you wouldn't sort of put up that next poll, um, and th this is going to form largely the basis of what we forward to the final uh, meeting on, on February 23rd of everybody. Um, so this is going to ask you to select the top three. So this is not, uh, don't just choose one. Um, so we want a sense of, of what are the highest priorities here for you of, of these things. Uh, the, the fair tax I shared, we also didn't discuss, but it's in the, in the package that you, that you forwarded and as, a, as, a, as a form of a national sales tax that sort of would get rid of all federal taxes and replace them essentially with this one way of doing business. Uh, this has been an idea that's been popular with many of our members for quite some time, but uh, as we just heard, it's unlikely to move forward in the near term. So we'll give folks a little bit of time to, to, to make their choices and then we'll let you know what, uh, what everybody said.
this is a little bit more complex because there are three choices, not just one or a ranking. All right, might as well click. We're getting close. It does. Let's keep it open for another 10 seconds and then I'll close All right. it. All right. Okay. Here we go. Oh, those are really interesting results. Thank you all. Um, yeah, lots of things bunched up near the top. The only one that's not a terribly high priority is the interstate sales tax for people. So that's uh, uh, very telling. All right. Well, this is really helpful. Uh, we are going to get these results on to the, to the main uh, 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 program in a couple of weeks. We encourage you to tune in for the other sessions we're going to have later this week and next week. Um, and I also wanted to take just a minute to thank our uh, uh, sponsor for this, which is Ring Central, who's been just a, a great partner uh, for NSBA. And uh, uh, we're going, they're going to sponsor a, uh, a webinar for us in March to sort of help you all understand how to use these tools uh, better for your, for your own businesses. And, and I think if, if there's also some significant discounts, I think they're prepared to offer for NSBA members uh, uh, to use these services. So uh, we, we, I just want to thank them very much. And I just want to turn it back to ML. She's uh, to, to, to offer her final thoughts uh, before we close for the day. So ML. Oh, I think you're still muted. What were you saying about Ring Central and them teaching us how to use these tools a little better? <laughs> As always, this was a really fascinating conversation, a good collaboration, well run, well informed, well questioned, which is one of the things that I really appreciate about, about the group that works together at NSBA. So thank you for your participation today and thank you Todd for, and Malcolm for leading us through this. I'm doing it too. So we'll say goodbye to everybody. Oh, and uh, we will see many of you tomorrow, I hope. Enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>